Well, marriage is an interesting uh, time, isn't it? To put uh, two different genders together from two completely different backgrounds and expect to mix that up and have a, a pleasant time all the time is really something, isn't it? <laughs> it's a, we've been at it 58 years, and I feel like he does at times. I don't have a clue of what to say, so it's best then to be quiet. <laughs> We're talking this morning about a phantom wife. Now, a real wife that's there with you and is talking directly to you, uh, that's a blessing. When you have a phantom wife, which means a wife that supposedly isn't there at all, that's something quite different. Last week, as I said in our opening, uh, I talked about an important man uh, that is not quoted in Scripture at all, and yet he was chosen by God to raise Jesus Christ from infancy to his teen years, and yet he's not quoted at all in Scripture. And I thought that that was a good uh, kind of a sidebar story, something perhaps most of our people hadn't thought of. And I had lunch with uh, my good friend, Pastor Rick Yokel from the great Tabernacle Baptist Church down the street. We've been doing that every Tuesday for the past seven years. You'd think he'd get tired of me by now, but somehow we make it through. And so we were talking about Joseph, and we were talking about how uh, he had such influence, and yet he was in the background. He isn't even quoted in Scripture. And he said, I got one better than that. <laughs> he said, um, I spoke on a wife that some great denomination says never existed. <laughs> well, that is one better than what I had, so we talked a little bit about it, and I wanted to put together my own uh, message regarding her from the Word of God. So if you turn to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and uh, we'll be beginning with verse or just 38 and 39. Luke chapter 4. 38 and 39. What we have here is a person not named and not recorded directly. Uh, however, leaving uh, no record of speech in the Bible, she is not to believe to have lived according to a large denomination. But I, that got my attention, and I can tell you astute Bible students here today, you know who I'm talking about already. Uh, you're right on top of it. Since Peter had a mother-in-law, we can uh, be sure he had a wife. There, Peter was married. And yet that's a big controversy because some of our friends don't believe that at all. What's interesting is this. She was married to a pretty extraordinary man, to say the very least. That means she had to be resourceful to marry a rough-talking, loud-mouthed fisherman like Peter. What faith it must have taken for her to take on that responsibility to be the wife of this man. And she had a mother that, that inculcated in her faith and trust in the Lord, and that caused Peter to be well-rounded in the Lord and matured some while he was with her. Some background on Peter's mother-in-law. We have here Peter's mother-in-law's house and her hospitality. She had the gift of hospitality. There are many Christians today that have the gift of hospitality. Mark tells us that Jesus had cast a demon out of the man in a synagogue in Capernaum. And after the service, was over with, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Jesus walked over to the house of Peter's mother-in-law. Her home was just a few blocks from the synagogue, and archaeologists have uncovered her home. According to what they have found, it indicates that the closed building was an important home, and is a pilgrimage site, and there's some graffiti there, and some other objects there that point to the fact that indeed it was uh, the home of Peter's mother-in-law. Luke 4.38 says this, Now he arose 
from the synagogue to enter Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother, Simon's wife's mother, was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. From this paragraph, we find out a great deal about Peter's mother-in-law. She was at home in bed with a fever. And in those days, there were three types of fever. The Malta fever, which was characterized by weakness, anemia, and wasting away. It lasted months and normally ended in death. The intermittent fever was like what is known today as typhoid fever. None of these were to be fooled with at all. Then there's malaria, still a killer over in the Middle East. It's bred in the plain where the Jordan River meanders into the Sea of Galilee. It was a problem for the lakeside towns of Galilee because it carried by mosquitoes. Peter's mother-in-law was in a life-threatening condition, and Dr. Luke, using medical terms, tells us that she had a high fever in Luke 4, 38. Jesus merely touched her. That's all he did. He never repeats how he heals people. Some he just touched. Others he just prayed. Others he wasn't even in their presence and they were healed. So Jesus does not have a constant, a consistent method of healing. Here he just touches her, which shows that he was not afraid of the fever. You know, this COVID thing has all but destroyed this nation. And what really concerned me about all this is the fear that people had of this. What are you afraid of? Yes, we should have a healthy respect for things like this, but to shut down an entire nation, to shut down every place of worship in America because of COVID, I think was planned by those who don't have the best in store for this nation at all. We're rebounding now, but it's going to take time for us to get back to the economy that we had, to get the people back in these seats. All across America, people have gotten used to watching church services on uh, television, on cable. We're on, and we reach out to 40 to 50 people a week beyond these walls, and we're going to continue to do so. But to shut down worship services where we congregate together and we encourage each other and we're accountable to each other and uh, we get blessings from each other because we're in person together is something quite different. I'm glad when our people are starting to come back now and to be with us. He merely touched her. And he rebuked the fever. And she raised up. And she didn't take some time off. She raised up and immediately started to serve those men who were there. So she was an extraordinary woman that had gifted and talents. And she used those as a ministry to God. Her story does not end with her hospitality to Jesus. It was just the beginning of a life made immediately available to Jesus and his ministry. Her home became his home. <laughs> and whenever Jesus was in Capernaum, he always had a place to stay. But there was even more. She had been healed on the Sabbath. Now, the legalist Pharisees of the day say healing is work. You cannot work on the Sabbath. You cannot heal on the Sabbath. Now, that's taking it to the nth degree. God is not into that kind of a thing at all. They had to wait until the Sabbath was over. They had to wait until the evening came. And they measured that by counting at least three visible stars in the heavens. And when three visible stars in the heavens came, officially, it was evening. It was the next day. So that's what they did. The whole city gathered at her door, Mark 133 says. 
So she not only ministered to uh, the disciples and to Jesus when they were there and the people from the temple, she ministered to the whole city. <laughs> now, that's a real talent if there ever was one. Did you ever think that maybe you don't matter much? Not many people know you. Not many people uh, are, are close to you. That's the way it is in America today. Oh, Pastor, I don't, I don't matter much. I don't, uh, I don't contribute very much. I, I just I handle my family and my property and things around me, but I, I don't matter. You matter a whole lot. <laughs> this is just one woman, and she ministered to the whole city. I don't know how big Capernaum was, but it was certainly not a little burg. There are enough people there to keep her good and busy. <laughs> Late into the night, miracle after miracle took place in her home. Diseases were defeated, demons were denounced, and all the miracles were, in Matthew's words, to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Matthew 8, 17. Her priorities were changed. Possessions no longer meant anything to her. When she met Jesus Christ, he had a profound change on her life. Time and again, the sick and oppressed were brought to her door and were healed. I have always been fascinated with the story of the uh, paralytic who was lowered through the roof into the room where Jesus was. Remember that? <laughs> Mark 1, 35 through 37. They, were, they, they couldn't find a way into her house. This is her house. Peter's mother-in-law. So they climbed up on the roof, and they had flat roofs, and they began to chop a hole in the roof. Now, can you imagine the people in that building at the time? Can you imagine? Here they're pontificating and talking about Scripture and all oh, having deep conferences and all that kind of thing, you know, a great time together. And all of a sudden, debris starts falling down on them. And they look up, and here's a hole. Here's a guy chopping a hole in the roof. Make it a little bigger, guys. Okay, measure it out. All right. So they're stunned, and they're down there, and they're looking at this. And comes the rope, with two ropes down, and here comes a paralytic. And he comes down, and he's roped onto his bed, and he settles right down in front of him. You talk about faith. You talk about caring for someone that needs to be cared for. You talk about stepping out. That's really stepping out. We're challenged, aren't we? When, when we read of things like this, first of all, she had to have the house there. She had to be known throughout the city as caring for people. She had to have that ability to handle hospitality with people. To the place where whatever it took to get people there that needed to be healed, those actions were taken. I remember my friend Paul West. Some of you might remember Paul West. I mentioned him last week, but he goes to a, a church out in the township, lives here in Hazel Park. Never been in this place before, and I got to know him. And uh, he, we became uh, great friends. He's now a missionary, I believe, in Europe. <laughs> anyway, Paul West, <laughs> he was something else. One year he brought 400 people to that church. I wish it was our church. 400 people to the place where his pastor said, Paul, please don't bring any more. We can't seat the people. So I asked him, I had his two chairs up here, and I interviewed him one Sunday morning. I said, Paul, what did you do to get those people there? You know what he told me? Whatever it took. Whatever it took. You need a ride, I'll get you a ride. You need food, I'll bring you food. You want me to personally take care of something? I'll take care of it. Four people. Now, he didn't invite 400 people. He brought 400 people. That's what? Uh, five and four, about 80. Uh, would that be 80 a week, maybe? 
eight a week? 400 people. Just think of that. One guy. That, that's, that's exemplified in Mark 1, 35 through 37. Now in the morning, having risen a long way before daylight, oh no, he went out and departed a solitary place and he prayed and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, <clears throat> they said to him, everyone is looking for you. This is after this event took place. The disciples and Jesus stayed in that home after the crowd had left, probably very early in the morning. Can you imagine witnessing something like that? And yet I urge our people, please, we're started back up. We need resources. We need your help. Would you please invite somebody? Just invite somebody. I made a few phone calls, and lo and behold, we got some folks here this morning that came because of those phone calls. I didn't even invite them in person, and they're here today. What would happen if all of us would do that? and just press people and say, look, what does it take to get you here? What does it take? I remember a church we were involved with years ago where they used to put uh, dollar bills and so forth under some of the seats to get people there. Now, that's going a bit far, I think, but that's pushing it, isn't it? But they would, everybody stand now, and we're going to worship. Oh, by the way, take a look under your seat. Oh, look at here. I got a $5 bill. They're actually paying people to come and, and be involved with the church. Maybe that's what it will take. I don't know. She had the gift of hospitality like none other in that city. At one time, this church was noted for that. We had a dozen buses or more that would go out and pick up up to 1,200 kids on a Sunday morning. We've got one, uh, several bus kids here They've grown up, and they're, they're quite old now. But they started off here on buses. We had one of the greatest bus ministries in the 50s, 60s, and 70s of any church in this nation. Other churches would send their, their, their bus cadre here to learn from our folks, and they'd see how we ran our bus ministry. That's the way the great Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, started their bus ministry. Dr. Jerry Falwell sent his people up in the late 50s to this church so that they can start a bus ministry pattern after what went on here. That had a profound impact on thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And yet today, here we are, where we are. (laughs) It's just the way things work, I guess. After the last miracle of the night was performed, the townspeople made their way home. Each of the visiting men found a corner of the house to curl up for the night. They just packed it in right there. (laughs) Can you imagine that? What a time that is. To have all the disciples, to have Jesus there. Can you imagine walking by and, who's that over in the corner? That's Jesus Christ. He's there sleeping. (laughs) What a scene that is, huh? I think if uh, someone would chop a hole in this roof and drop somebody down on a bed right here on this platform and that person was healed and ran up that aisle singing the praises of God and shouting the praises, I think probably we'd have a few more people here on a Sunday. Maybe that's what we need to do. (laughs) We have some of our Thursday... uh, food distribution team here who are faithful to be out there. Every Thursday we had food distribution, all kinds of weather, about 10, 11 months a year. And we gave out three and a half million pounds of food in 10 years' time. And you know what? I don't see a person here, maybe one or two that I could think of, that came off of that food line. Now, some of our workers came off of that food line and joined in and helped our team. But can you imagine the the hundreds of thousands of meals that that represented, and we didn't have anybody come on a Sunday out of that. That wasn't our motivation, but it would have been nice since we put all of that effort into it. So, first of all, she had the gift 
of hospitality, and her house and everything was on the line for the Lord. Secondly, the mother-in-law's influence. Now, mothers and grandmothers, you have an influence on your kids and your grandkids. They look to you. As they order their lives, you become the pattern for that. You have great influence on them, whether you know it or not. They're watching you all the time. They know if you're genuine, if you really love Jesus Christ. They know a genuine article. And they know that you're going to bring them here and not drop them off at the door. You're going to come in and worship with them. I always enjoyed that when our girls were with us. We'd all be there as a family sitting right over there. We'd all be here, and we'd all worship the Lord, and we would enjoy ourselves as a family here. So you have influence on her. Now think of this for a moment. Such a great mother-in-law allowing Jesus to minister in her home and serving the master and the disciples with faithful assistance must have raised a daughter with the same faith, skills, and abilities that she possessed that had to rub off on her daughter. Maybe that's why Peter married her. He saw those good qualities in her. She was set aside because of the influence of the mother's uh, life and of the mother's home and the hospitality that was shown there for complete strangers. Neither woman is named in Scripture. Again, I have people tell me, well, you know what? Uh, I don't have any talent. I don't have any ability. What can I do for the Lord? I don't know a lot of people. You know, my friend Paul West, he started with one person. He brought one person to church. And then he began to bring two people to church. And he began to bring three people to church. It started with one person. And a year later, he had 400. We don't know what God can do through us. We have no idea what he'll turn us into and how the skills will be inculcated into us and, and then brought to fruition. And we see all kinds of things happening because we're involved. And then we step out on faith. It's just amazing to me the influence that she had. And yet God didn't make a big deal out of her. Now, she impacted an entire city, and God didn't even name her. She impacted an entire town, and God didn't even have, uh, have her quoted in any scripture in any form whatsoever. <laughs> that didn't bother her. She didn't get upset when she said, hey, my name isn't in scripture. What is this? I think I'll give up. I want people to know at least who I am. <laughs> Ever been around people like that around the church? <laughs> Why? I'm the treasurer of this church. Not a nickel gets spent unless I say so. <laughs> oh, boy, come on. That's little people way in over their little heads. I used to be chair of the uh, Board of Deacons here, and I didn't know half of the, half of the people that were working. The, the bus workers, we hardly ever saw them. They're over in the old building down in the bus room. I didn't know all those bus captains. Didn't know them at all. Prayed for them, but I didn't know them. There are other people in other ministries. The youth ministry here ran over 200 kids. I knew the youth pastor, but I didn't know any of the workers. I didn't know any of the kids up there. I didn't have to. It's important that God knew them, and we stood behind them. I didn't ask for their names and all of that kind of thing. We let that up to God. We just serve him whether we're known or not. We just serve him because we have that desire to see other people give their lives to him. I was on the phone three different times this week with a gal in this neighborhood that's an alcoholic. In fact, she goes into uh, treatment tomorrow, so pray for her. And man, I, uh, for 45 minutes, I tried to tell her about Jesus Christ. Not about a church, not about a catechism. I told her it's a relationship and not religion. And, and, and you know, it, it's very difficult when people are mixed up in that kind of thing to get them on the right track. 
I kept telling her scripture after scripture, verse after verse, and ended up praying for her. And we're going to stay in touch with her when she goes through rehab, and hopefully she'll start coming here. I didn't say it was easy. I just said it's wonderful to do it and to be a part of it and to be used of God. Mother-in-law had great influence. The Bible says this, if we have a wife, we're blessed, contrary to what went on on that screen. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 4 says, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. If my wife would let me, oh, I'm going to pay for this one. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love to tell people what she does in the background around this place. I, she, she won't let me do that. We couldn't operate, frankly, without her. That's just the bottom line. A wife is a wonderful gift from God. And when she has a Christian background, her mother was a Christian, and she got the good vibes and, and, and uh, actions from her mother. It handed down to her, and then she uses them in our family. We're double blessed. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, Proverbs 18.22. You bet. I have favor with God because I have a Christian wife who's for real, and she keeps me for real. I don't get too far out of line. She's right on me when I am. I can bust a message out here that I have this whole town on their knees thanking God. And we'll go home and I'll say, well, how do you think it went? Oh, it was all right. It was all right. We've got people just all over the city talking about it. It was okay. In other words, you're not getting a big head around me. She keeps me in balance. And there's a whole lot of pastors, pastoring great churches today, that got out of balance and got out of their uh, job by God. They were judged by God because they weren't balanced. They got full of themselves. The praise of people overwhelmed them. Guaranteed that's not happening at our house. <laughs> Christians' husbands are uh, to demonstrate toward their wives the same unselfish spirit as Christian citizens with understanding. In other words, there's Christian citizens under the, out there that pray for us that aren't a part of us at all. And a Christian husband should be intimately aware of his wife's needs and, uh, and here strengthened and her weaknesses and so forth. We're to be, we're to be compatible. We're to hold each other up. She's uh, strong in some areas, or I am weak, and vice versa. That's the way God wants it. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife, honoring her. As to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I remember I told one of my sons-in-law that. You're not going to get your prayers answered if you treat your wife that way. Not that she's our daughter, but any wife and any husband. God says that's a serious thing with him. We're to pray for our wives. We're to hold them up and encourage them. And thank them and comfort them and be there for them. Your prayers may be hindered, and that indicates that Christmas Christian's husband's spiritual relationship with God is directly affected by the way he treats his wife. This tender teaching comes from a former rough, tough, loudmouth fisherman. Believe you me, he wrote First and Second Peter to straighten out a lot of things he was wrong about. He becomes a gentle, gracious, loving person, partially because of the wife he was married to. Thirdly, Peter's wife is a valuable ministry support. Um, I remember when we started teaching our Sunday school classes. Uh, Sandy would be there and arrange everything, and get all things started, and she'd be in there with me. And, you know, that, that's just a wonderful thing when a wife believes in your ministry, believes in what you're doing, and supports you. Peter had that. Now, where is that in the Bible? 
1 Corinthians 9, 3 through 5. 1 Corinthians 9, 3 through 5. There's only two verses of Scripture that reference the mother-in-law and his wife. My defense to those who examine me. This is Paul writing. He's defending the people who are, who are uh, throwing out accusations against him. You're on these missionary trips. You're living like a king, Paul. You're asking us to send money to you. What are you spending it on? Those are the kind of accusations that were being thrown around. So this is his defense. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat or drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? W-I-F-E. As so as do others, the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. He's actually named. He took his wife, his loving, supportive wife, out on the mission trips with him. She was there to support him while he was out there yonder. We've had a number of missionaries and their wives leave this congregation and go out all around the world on missions. Since I've been here, we've placed six pastors out there in little works all around this area. Six of them. Just think if they would have stayed here and helped us build this church, if they're building other churches, other works out there. That's the way God wanted, they wanted to incubate here, learn here, and then move out and be in their own ministry someplace. 1 Corinthians 9, 3 through 5 is vitally important. Peter had a believing, serving wife that helped his ministry even on missionary journeys that were exceedingly difficult on the servants of the Lord, much less their wives who provided great support to their husbands. Now let me ask you something here. Do you think you are not... You do not amount to so much that you uh, only serve the Lord at home. Uh, maybe you're a prayer warrior. Over the years, we've had great prayer warriors here. Man, you give them, Pat Brown was one of them. You give, you give her a prayer request, and we had a prayer team that would start praying. And boy, things would get done. I'll never forget her. She's a great, great woman. And you know, uh, if you're praying and no one knows about it except God, God bless you. Keep doing it. Don't let up. We don't have to be in headlines. In fact, that ruins people when the spotlight is on them in most cases. You think you do not amount to much? You amount to a whole lot. Believe me, you are important, my friend. Does your day-to-day -day repetitive support of your family seem to be routine and unappreciated. Do the wash, <laughs> hang clothes up, pick things up off the floor, clean the house, and on and on it goes. And you think maybe, oh boy, this is just a waste of time. I'm so tired of doing this. God knows all about it, and he richly rewards you in its own way. Don't you give up. You're important to him. Be assured, even though you serve in the background, doing repetitive tasks that nobody seems to care about. And even if your name is not recorded or recognized on earth, your rewards for faithful service is recorded in heaven, and great will be your eternal reward. So we have Matthew 10, 40 and 42. Jesus says this, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. In other words, if, if you're a Christian and you witness to somebody and they receive Jesus Christ, they receive the Lord and they receive the Father. So it's mighty important that we do that. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. In other words, you'll receive the same rewards that the great men and women of the Bible received from the Lord himself. And who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever gives of these little ones only a cup of cold water. Think of how many times you've done that, Mom. Think of how many times you've done that, Grandma. You gave them a cup of cold water. You fed them their meal. You took care of them. Well, he that does that 
In the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Matthew 10, 40-43. That may not be your motivation, but that's going to be your reward. Great is your reward in heaven. We're going to be mighty surprised with those that are going to get great rewards from Jesus Christ. We never heard of them. They may have never even been here. Maybe they've been on a bed of affliction all their life, and yet they remember this ministry. They remember us in prayer. Prayer warriors are going to get a great reward. And then this one in Luke 6.35. Love your enemies. Do good and lend hope uh, for nothing to re in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. That's what we were before we were saved. He was kind to us even before we knew him. He's even more kind to us once we give our lives to him. There are people making headlines today. Great preachers. Men on televangelists. Flying in jet planes all over the world. Having their names spread everywhere. Living in multi-million dollar homes. Living like kings today. Well... They could have their headlines here, but that's about all they're going to get. There's going to be a whole lot of people in that line ahead of them that are going to get a whole lot of rewards, just like you, if you're faithful in doing what God told you to do. Amen? Are you awake out there? Anybody say amen? Amen. Thank you. Peter's mother-in-law, house and hospitality, was used by her as a great tool for the Lord. The mother-in-law's influence was not only used by her, but had an influence on her daughter, who married Peter, and even went out on the mission field under some difficult circumstances with him. And Peter's wife had a valuable ministry support that isn't recognized even to this day. And I want us to think this week, just take a few minutes and think this week of how God has used you some of you are raising your grandchildren or have raised your grandchildren because of some things that have come up in the family and you had to take on that extra responsibility. Thank you for being faithful to do that. God has great rewards for your faithfulness. You're so valuable to the Lord in his kingdom. Just think about that. Take some time. Think about that. Your work, though it may be unseen or appreciated, is of great impact to the Lord's kingdom. It's actually the lubrication that makes this thing go. You may just uh, give a small offering or tithe on a regular basis. Believe me, that means more than you can ever imagine to keep these lights on and to keep these utilities going and to keep these doors open. You may work behind the scenes around this building, just keeping it up, the small repairs that we're capable to make to keep us going during this interim time. You're incredibly important. You're not making headlines here. You're making headlines where it counts in heaven. Amen? Rejoice, folks, because God is with you. Rejoice that he knows what you're doing. Rejoice that he loves you and he gave you those gifts that you're now using for his kingdom and for his glory. Rejoice in knowing there's a great reward. Even though your name's not written down, in any place <laughs> important. Just know he loves you and he loves what you're doing. And he's saying one day to you, well done, now good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the kingdom, which we have saved before you. Thank you, Father, for those who are behind the scenes, those who are diligent, those who are using your gifts, even though they're not rewarded openly. They will be someday. And we thank you for that. Bless us as we go our way this week. Remind us that you're watching over us and how much you appreciate everything that's done in your name. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.